Our scripture reading is from Romans 9, verse 30, to Romans 10, verse 4. What then shall we say, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it, if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Good morning, church. Okay, one for you. And one for you. Now hold, hold that carefully. Okay. People have, people have died for that flag. I have in my hand the artwork that was done this morning by your children in commemoration of Veterans Day. I want to add to that, and that's why I invited you to come up. All those who are our first responders who have been so amazing in their protection of our homes and our community. So if you have served and you know who I'm talking to, if I say, if you have served to protect the United States of America, would you please stand? I know, I know, yes indeed, yes indeed. We thank you, and uh, you know, we try, I do, I want you to know, um, we try whenever we can to say thank you for your service, thank you. And uh, we just also thank those who are first responders in our area. You can tell your dad thank you very much. I know that he was pretty tired this last week when I got together with him to help, when he was helping his mother-in-law. Yes, Mike, you were helping your mother-in-law. And that is awesome, even after his shift as a fireman. Okay, so it's not just those who go abroad and who show American muscle, but it is those who support them at home, too, that we want to thank today. Thank you for what you do. Amen. There's a part of me that wants to rebel. Actually, it's a pretty big part. And I'm wondering how many of the rest of you would like to rebel with me. I think that Thanksgiving is a lost holiday in these United States. I'm rebelling even though it's not Thanksgiving Sabbath, for you shall be hearing from Richard and Annika Guy on that Sabbath. So don't miss it. It is a Sabbath not to be missed. But in the next couple of Sabbaths, I would like to talk about the pilgrims. Yes, I sat with my friend Barry, who gave us a great children's story today about finding treasure in the kingdom of God. And we talked about what the season is about. And he said, you know, I haven't heard a lot about pilgrims lately. And it got me thinking. It's a lost holiday, I believe, and 
With that loss, I believe that we may just be losing our soul. You know, on those websites, when you put up your profile, you might say, in search of. I'm in search of. I have a feeling that America today is in search of its soul, maybe even its soul mate. You see, because the pilgrims that we, we are forgetting because now Halloween, excuse me while I wash that word out of my mouth, um, is the second biggest holiday in America. Okay, and we rush now on to, oh, what did you say, Black Friday? Just a quick reminder, who is the happiest person on Black Friday? Amazon, yeah, well, yeah. But all the people that work with Amazon too, right? Oh, Amazon's doing great business in our household. But you see, the pilgrims, the pilgrims that we seem to have forgotten were fleeing. They were fleeing tyranny. They were fleeing, and they were also willing to take the chance to establish something new, something God-focused. They, they were willing to start over. They were willing to plow new ground, and they were willing to encounter new societies. Now, we have, we have some real history, of course, and then we have the history that, that we look at in picture books, and it's an artist's impression. But as I grew up, and yes, I did go to elementary school in North America, and uh, uh, I did hold up the United States flag for a whole five years in the country of England, where for the first year while I was there, I was known as Yank. You know what that's like, don't you? Oi, oi, Yank, you want to play football? And they weren't going to be playing with a football. They were going to be playing with a soccer ball, but they call it football. And they figured I didn't know what that was, but they were wrong because six months after I got there, they stopped picking me last. Thank God. <laughs> Pilgrims were willing to encounter new societies. Remember, what was it Squanto? Okay, the people that were living in America that they made contact with, they didn't know Europeans. Unless, of course, they knew the Danes who may have come over. And so they had this meal that has been deified in the food industry as second only to Christmas dinner. And all the turkeys are very scared right now. Well, the chickens are too. And if you're going to have turducken, you know, and if you're going to need those special pants I heard about this last week that are able to expand three sizes while you sit at one meal, eating your turducken. You don't know what a turducken is? A turkey stuffed with a chicken excuse me, stuffed with a duck, who is stuffed with a chicken. You've never heard of a turducken. Okay, well, don't. Don't even bother. Thanksgiving was this great time when people said, you know what? We fled tyranny. We came to a new place. We established ourselves in the name of God for his sake. And he has blessed us. He has saved us. He has given us new life in a new land. This is pilgrim. This is, this is what 
we think of as Americans when we think of pilgrims. And we have cartoons about it. We have pictures about it. We have all sorts of ideas in our minds. I believe that today we can also say with pretty good authority that we are still pilgrims. Now you can say, no, 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 we're settlers. And you might be right. But I do want to encourage us today to think of ourselves as pilgrims. Reason being, I, I believe we are still on a journey. We're still on a journey, still building what one of our great presidents called the Great Society. We're still doing that. It's still evolving, as it were. I'm just hopeful that it will still involve God. You're still believing that this land is your land, this land is my land, that God had and still has a great plan for this land, this great society of ours. I also believe that we have a conundrum. It's a nice, nice big word, don't you think? Conundrum. You can say it and you, you sound like you have a doctorate. Well, a conundrum is just this complicated situation. We have this complicated situation in which we find ourselves as Christian pilgrims. Okay? In a land that was originally settled in the name of the Christian God. We have a conundrum today because we want to sing songs like, I'm a pilgrim and I'm a wandering. No, that's not. Eric, Eric, you've got to help me here. I'm a Christian pilgrim. Or how about, how about this one? Uh, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian. How about, Lord, I want to be a pilgrim? Yes? That's on the one side of the conundrum, and, and, and you're thinking about all the hardship and all the difficulty and all the, the complications that come along with wanting to be a pilgrim today. And on the other hand, you have this, this other side which... Where, where we want to enjoy what God has given to us as human beings on planet Earth and particularly in this wonderful, wonderful country of ours. And so we sing with great gusto, This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that, Oh, the wrong seem oft, oft so strong. God is the ruler yet. And how about, how about the fact that maybe he's calling upon us to enjoy all this wonderfulness that he provides for us every day? I love where I live for this one main reason. Sunset. It's never the same twice. There's times when I think the clouds or no, the no clouds or the, just the atmosphere provides what I call the blue and the orange. Have you seen the blue and the orange? Okay, as you look east from Santa Clarita on a clear day, and if you want a good place, Starbucks on uh, Golden Valley. It's kind of high up and you can look east and you can see this gorgeous sunset every, not every day, but lots of days, where it gets orange, and then there's, you look up into the atmosphere, and it's blue, and, and it silhouettes the mountains, and it's just gorgeous. Question that I have is, are we so worried about being the pilgrim that, that we are not enjoying my father's world? It's hard. It's hard to, to do both, it seems, at the same time. It's, it's hard to drink in the, the vastness of all that God has for us, the, the bigness, the huge generosity that he gives us every day. 
and to know that this is true for billions and billions of human beings every day, some of which do not enjoy, let's say most of which, do not enjoy the life that you and I lead in this great country of ours. They find it hard to enjoy the generosity of the maker because life is just so hard and so complicated. So when we think about pilgrims, uh, the question comes up into, in, into my mind, if pilgrims were people who were running away from something, and in that same vein, we can say they were also running toward something, right? They left Europe and they ran or took the boat toward the new, this place that had been discovered that was unpopulated and where they could start over. Being a pilgrim is confusing because you see, I don't think that it's either or. I don't think it's just running away from, it's also running toward. Being a pilgrim is about running from, I believe, the tyranny of man or humanity thinking that they have all the answers. You thought about that this week? I was talking to a friend about that this week and his co-worker had asked him because he knows that this guy is a Christian and he's asking him about his Christian God. Asking him the question that millions of Americans ask, millions of people around the world ask, how can these bad things be happening if your God is in control? The pilgrims ran away from a system that had caused them to be forced to worship in ways that they did not believe in. Forced them to believe in ideas that had been cooked up by various people and then supported by the church. Forced to believe that this was the truth. This was ultimate truth. And then were forced to be sidelined and pushed out of society if they refused to believe this way. Being a pilgrim is not only running from, but it's also running towards. It's running towards a Savior who has never let anyone down, never left anyone behind, and, and who truly wants to give his help to humanity. Believing this, pilgrims got on the ship and went to America because they believed that God would help them. I think in small ways we do the same thing. We run from that which has been man-made and we run towards that which is God-made. If we choose to run towards God, we, we go on a pilgrimage. You ever thought that pilgrims, what do pilgrims do? Well, they go on pilgrimages. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just the normal pilgrimage that brought the pilgrims to, to this country, but they were believing that they were on a pilgrimage to the celestial city. Now, if you're uh, in any way associated with the Adventist church and its message, you, you will, you, your ears will be up right now, your antennae will be listening, and you're saying, oh, well, that sounds like us, doesn't it? We're teaching, we're preaching the fact that we can, and maybe we would use the imperative and say, we should be on a journey, on a pilgrimage to the celestial city. The promise of Jesus is that he will walk with us on this pilgrimage and that he will explain a few things, not everything, but that he will explain a few things on the way. 
I believe that time spent, time spent, now this could be for you every morning, this could be for you sometime at night, this could be while you're on your long drive down to LA and you're listening to that podcast, time spent trusting in him, listening to him as our leader, as your leader, helps to establish our faith while we are along the way, while we are on this pilgrimage. I believe that that time builds, builds confidence in him and we trust him with our lives. We begin to trust him more and more with our lives and with the lives of our families. I'm, I'm almost sure, can't be absolutely sure because I don't know, but I'm almost sure that the parents in the hearing of my voice would be willing to do just about anything for their children. Now, where did you get that idea? Where did you get that, that idea that that's the right thing? Well, that's because you've been spending time with a God who has said, I will do anything, including giving up my son so that you can be successful in your pilgrimage. You can be successful. Pilgrims who came to America came to get away from the tyranny that, uh, that, that had also infected the church. They could no, the church could no longer be trusted. So they established their own society based on their understanding of the God of the Bible. To this day, the laws of this land are based on the instruction of the laws that God gave his people long ago. His pilgrims that he saved from Egypt, another place of tyranny. Our laws are based upon those laws that he gave to his chosen people. And I would say that America still is the destination of pilgrims who are attracted. They are attracted to the light that Lady Liberty shines from her torch in New York Harbor and on our coinage. But we must learn, I believe, in this day and age, we must learn from the mistakes of God's chosen people. Rather, as our text in Romans today would show us, rather than stumbling over the good news, and I've deliberately phrased it in those terms. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. You'll see this piece. It's got the, the chapter break right in between it, but I, I want you to remember that those chapter breaks weren't always there. So here, here the apostle, as he is talking today to us pilgrims, and he is saying, uh, uh, why, uh, verse 32, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Okay? We've heard a lot in the news about scandals political and otherwise, right? You know that that word is the same word for the stone. The Greek word here is scandalon. The stumbling stone was the scandal called Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? This is what the text is saying to us today. Along comes Jesus and the pilgrims were interrupted in their pilgrimage by God himself. If we want to learn from that, we should not look at the good news of the gospel as a stumbling stone, but rather as the rock, as Paul says later on, as the rock of the cornerstone of our foundation of our faith. Again, as we progress, as we go along, as pilgrims, we 
continue to get to know this God that has been willing to walk with us all of the way along, and he then helps to confirm our choice. Our faith eventually becomes sight. Paul is telling us his heart today. Romans 10. God's people, the Israelites, which in this case is talking about an actual people in Romans 10. But I want to point on further in Romans 10 and 11. He's also talking about anyone who accepts Jesus as their leader becomes a spiritual Israelite. So when you read Israelite in this passage, understand that he is talking to us today too. God's people should be running away from the tyranny of man-made, man-enforced spirituality. When Jesus came, God's people stumbled over him. How come? Because they were going forward believing that what they believed, the, the God concept that they had, the God idea that they had was what God wanted and that the more they did well with this concept, the more God would be pleased with them. To this day, the Jewish faith believes that if they could just keep the law perfectly, once the Messiah would come. Did you know that about your particularly orthodox Jewish friends? That the Messiah is not going to come until they keep the law perfectly. Have you heard anything like that ever talked about in this denomination? Oh, Jesus can't come back. Finish the sentence. Until the work is done. And people feel like that's not only work out in society, but it's also work in us. So if, if you're hearing me today, please read Paul. Hear Paul today when he says in Romans chapter 10, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. We can be, we, can, we, we get a gold star, right? We're zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. My friends, I'll say it again. If we understand what the pilgrims were doing when they left Europe and came to America, they were running from the tyranny of a man-made idea about God and running towards a God-inspired idea about God. Do you see why when we forget to do this, when we forget to see ourselves as pilgrims in the same process of running away from but running toward, that we just may find ourselves on the list of the Israelites that Paul is talking about here. That we just are not getting it. We talk about Jesus, we talk about the law, and we just are not getting it. So I say again, when Jesus came, his people stumbled. He tripped them, you could say. 
They're walking along thinking that they are going in the right way and they stumble over a stone. This stone is called the scandalon. This is the stumbling stone. He interrupted their lives. He interrupted their ideas about God. Have you ever thought that that's what Jesus did? Here's, here's how I know he did. Finish, finish this. Uh, he's talking about, um, oh, let, let, let me pick divorce, or he's talking about a lot of things in, in his sermons, and he has said, you have heard that it was said. What does he say next? But I say to you, when you hear Jesus saying that, you must understand he's speaking to the Israelites that Paul is talking about here. He's speaking to them and he is saying, you have understood God from your own perspective and you think that you need to defend that perspective because God will give you a gold star for defending it. But what if he doesn't need defending and what if what you're saying is not what he wants you to say. Pilgrims. Pilgrims ran away from tyranny and ran towards a new society, a new setup. His people, Jesus' people, stumbled over him because he interrupted their ideas about him. Their ideas were not God-made, but they were man-made. They were supposed to be the chosen people, and they were the apple of his eye. And he still wants a people to be his people. But they need to be the people who understand who he is, and are willing to be okay with that. Folks, it, it's really, really tough to talk to people these days about God because you just don't know the baggage that they have about God. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I find it really hard to talk to people about the Creator God because so many people believe in evolution. And, 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 and then there are even Christians. Yes, there are even Christians who believe in evolution. And I, I find, it, find it very hard to figure that one out, but I'm, I'm trying. Trust in Jesus Christ means freedom from the tyranny that is within each one of us. And that tyranny is that we all want to have our own ideas. We all want to develop our own picture of God. And then we base our lives on that picture. We believe that God is a certain person or a certain thing and, and he does for us in certain ways. And believe me, if that picture is not based on scripture, it will lead us into a difficult place. The tyranny that says we are our own God. That our ideas are the top of the food chain. That's why it's hard to talk to somebody who doesn't believe in Scripture, doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. As I've been studying with various individuals recently, I've reminded them that that's why in, in our statement of beliefs as Seventh-day Adventists, the first statement is not about God. It's about the Bible. Because if you don't have the Bible as the basis for your discussion about God, then you have every other idea that is possible out there 
And that means millions of ideas that people are deciding to believe in that are not part of what Scripture says. Being a pilgrim today, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 and 10, means letting Jesus Christ, letting the, the Messiah that was predicted to come, that was told would come from a, a particular people whom, who were waiting for him to come. When John the Baptist shows up, people were excited because they knew that, the, the, that if John the Baptist had shown up, then surely the Messiah was going to be coming. And yet they still, they still were not at the airport to meet him. Yes, I have to give a shout out to South Africa today because they won the Rugby World Cup. And yes, thousands, thousands of South Africans showed up to the airport when the Springbok team got off of the plane because they had won the World Cup for only the second time in rugby history. Thousands of people showed up. Who showed up when the Messiah came? The Israelites? No. The servants. The people left with the dirty jobs. The shepherds. That's who the angels sang to and said, the one you have been looking forward to seeing is here. And, and he, you can find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, which is another way of saying his father's grave clothes, because every good Israelite traveled with his own grave clothes so that if he perchance died on the way, he could be wrapped up and put in a grave. So they used Joseph's grave clothes to wrap their newborn in. And the angels told the shepherds, you will find the Messiah, the one that you have been looking for, wrapped in his father's grave clothes in a stable behind the inn. He came in a most unexpected way. It didn't fit the picture that the people had of the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. It was not until almost before he died that he rides the colt and he gets on that colt and they cut palm trees down and they throw their, their cloaks down on the road and they say, Hosanna to the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. And within a few hours, maybe, maybe 72 hours, he was dead on a Roman cross that had on the top of it Jesus of Nazareth King of the Jews yes the Romans had been watching and here comes this wonderful parade and this guy is being touted as the next king of Israel and they said right anyone who thinks that they can be king of Israel this is what we're going to do to them it was a political statement, my friends. They put him between two thieves like a common criminal because they wanted to make a statement that anyone who thinks that they can overpower the Roman Empire, anyone who does not bow the knee to Caesar, this is what we're going to do to them. This is what we will do to pilgrims who think that they can run away from the tyranny of this world. Are you ready? You want to be a pilgrim? Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. You need to run away from the man-made ideas. Well, let's be honest, from your own ideas. And run towards the God-inspired ideas of who he says that he is. And when you do that, when you do that, you will realize that the only way that we are going to see him face to face, as I prayed this morning, the only way we're going to see him face to face is if we trust him. 
I'm in my car riding to church this morning and I had to write this down. It's a song on Caleb. The chorus goes, I'm more than you think I am. So please understand that as pilgrims today, as pilgrims today, we have to let God be God. Let him tell us who he is and what he would like us to do and the kind of society, the kind of great society that he would like us to have. As pilgrims, we need to go away from our own ideas of who God is and claim what Jesus says about who God is. Otherwise, we'll end up like Nicodemus that night when he came to speak with Jesus. You remember? He was too shy to do it in the daytime. Didn't want to be associated So he comes at night, and Jesus asks him about how you are saved. And Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, doesn't know or understand. Jesus is shocked. And then he says, Those famous words, my friends, which just roll off of our tongue, but were absolutely world-changing to Nicodemus. For God so loved the whole world that he gave everything. For everybody. That night, Nicodemus' God concept was shattered. My appeal to you today is, as an Israelite, as a pilgrim, as a God follower, let God shatter your dream of who he is again and again and again until we see him face to face And we know who he is. We look up and we say, this, this is our God. He has come back and he has saved us. Amen.